Welcome back to Bargaining 101. I'm William Spaniel, and this lecture is on making threats credible. It's the topic of Chapter 6 of Game Theory 101 Bargaining. You can check the video description for more information about that. And I'm also happy to announce that it came out in paperback just this week, so you really should check it out. It is quite a bargain. Yeah, I went there. Anyway, what we're covering in this lecture is making threats credible, and what I want to do here is actually look at a belief, a perception about the world, versus what's actually true. The belief is that it is always better to leave your options open. I'm sure you've heard someone say that this is a good idea. And in fact, it is true. This can be very useful, very often, leaving your options open, but it is not always the case that you should be leaving your options open. So why might you want to leave your options open? Well, if there's a lot of uncertainty out there in the world, maybe in not only what you want later on, but also what other people are going to do, then it might seem reasonable and might in fact actually be right for you to delay as long as you can to get more information about what's going on out there and then make a well-informed decision. However, there's this competing problem that may override the desire and the optimality of leaving your options open until the last minute. And that is backing yourself into a corner can sometimes be better when it makes a threat credible. And we can see this in an ultimatum game. So this is your standard ultimatum game where Albert is trying to divide a surplus worth one with Barbara. And if Barbara rejects, both players receive zero. And again, we know in an ultimatum setup, what happens here is that Albert can demand everything for himself, leaving Barbara with nothing. So Barbara actually gets a pretty bad outcome here. She doesn't get to enjoy any of the surplus, which is problematic. Now, the reason that this is happening, the reason that Barbara can't earn anything from this situation is that her payoff for rejecting is nothing. Rejecting looks really bad here, and so by virtue of the fact that it's really bad, she's willing to accept anything Albert throws at her. Well, what would be nice for Barbara is if she could somehow make accepting, say, less than one half of the surplus more painful to her than rejecting. Think about what would happen if that's the case. If Barbara is in a situation where if she's offered anything less than half of the good, to her, rejecting would be even more painful than accepting some of those gains from bargaining. Well, if that's the case, think about how this is going to cause fear for Albert. Albert wants to get a deal done. He wants to be able to enjoy some of the surplus for himself. And so if he knows that Albert, or rather, if Albert knows that Barbara is going to reject low offers because she finds accepting these low offers to be more painful than rejecting them, then Albert is going to have to increase his offer to Barbara so that Barbara gets more of the good so she's willing to accept, which then allows Albert to capture some of the surplus. That would be better than having Barbara reject the offer and Albert getting none of the surplus for himself. Now the problem here is that Barbara is in a position where she can't just say that she's going to be rejecting things that are less than one half. She actually needs this to be true in order for this effect to work. Why is that? Well, a threat is only credible if you have the incentive to follow through on it. If you are going to, when push comes to shove, back down and not follow through on your threat, your threat is incredible. It is not credible. And if you're in a situation where Albert is trying to negotiate over some sort of bargaining surplus with you, Albert is only going to be believing these credible threats. Because an incredible threat won't actually come when push comes to shove. It will not actually happen. And so Albert has no reason to listen to a threat that will not be followed through on. So if you're trying to make one of these threats credible, if you're trying to make it so that accepting an offer that's very small is worse for you than rejecting it, you can't just say it. It needs to actually be true. And so what I talk about in chapter six of the book are some of the ways that people do this. Uh, first, you might have heard of this. This is a classic story about burning a bridge, a situation where it literally becomes impossible for you for whatever reason. In one case, burning a bridge, which prevents you from retreating in a particular story that I go into in the book that prevents you from actually accepting these low offers. So there's one example. Another example is a tripwire strategy. A tripwire strategy was, uh, for example, a situation that occurred during the Cold War where the United States actually stationed troops in Berlin, United States American troops in Berlin, not for the purposes of defending the city so much as being there to die in the case the Soviet Union tried to invade Berlin. 
The reason being that this is a tripwire. When American soldiers die in Berlin, this might cause havoc elsewhere in the world for the Soviet Union because the United States would be upset. And that might in turn deter the Soviet Union from trying to invade Berlin, which made the United States' payoff and the West's payoff higher under those circumstances because they had a credible threat. And the last thing I talk about in the book in Chapter 6 is bargaining by proxy. So you can think about a situation either as uh, some party, somebody in a, a legal issue, a legal party, or as a union, those kinds of, of people tend to hire negotiators, people who are not actually a part of the union or a part of the legal issue itself, to negotiate on their behalf. And the reason that this sometimes is effective is that individual negotiators like that have this incentive to maintain their reputation of being tough negotiators, of strength essentially, either in both the, the union situation, a tough union negotiator, or a tough legal negotiator. And so by virtue of the fact that these individuals have this incentive to be really tough, this will then make those negotiators more likely to reject low offers from the other party, which then forces the other party to increase the offers to you, which of course in turn benefits you. So those are some examples I talk about in the book about how to make threats credible. There's a lot more detail in the book when you, when you take a look at it, uh, if you're interested in this sort of idea of making threats credible. In any case, I hope you enjoyed this lecture, and I hope to see you next time. Take care.